Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Welcome to Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. This is Casey Rathburn. I'm a student at the University of Houston College of Pharmacy and our APHA ASP Chapters President. Um, We are at the APHA Institute on Alcoholism and Drug Dependencies in Salt Lake City, Utah. Today, my guest is Brian. Welcome, Brian. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello. (laughs) My name is Brian Fingerson, actually. I am a pharmacist in long-term recovery from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. I'm a 1973 graduate of North Dakota State University, and I've lived in Kentucky since uh, graduation in 1973. All right, so um, you're what they call a dinosaur here uh, at Institute, so would you like to explain to us what that yeah. means? <laughs> yes, I sure would, Casey. There, there are a number of us that keep coming back to this Institute year after year. This is actually the fourth year of the APHA Institute as it is now constituted. Prior to that, mm-hmm. it used to be the University of Utah School on Alcoholism and Other Drug Dependencies, and mm-hmm. when when the school ended uh, that contained multiple other uh, professions besides pharmacy, the decision was made through APHA to continue it in, in a slightly different iteration for uh, pharmacists and student pharmacists. And this is the fourth annual of that. Um, there are a number of us that have been coming for many, many years, and uh, we decided that since there are many dinosaur uh, uh relics and and whatnot in, in the Utah area that mm-hmm. we would uh, call those of us that are the old timers the dinosaurs. <laughs> now we've we've since added in some that have been here for say three years or so we call them the the hatchlings. Oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so can you explain to us um, why you originally came um, when it was um, the Utah School of Alcoholism and Drug Sure, Foods? sure. Uh, it, it happened through a, a mechanism. I really don't know how it began, but mm-hmm. I had a call in 1986 from the uh, office of the Kentucky Pharmacists Association asking mm-hmm. if I'd be interested in uh, coming to Frankfort, Kentucky to to meet to see if we could put together a committee of folks to to uh, maybe try and help people in the profession of pharmacy who may have uh, problems with drugs or with alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know why they called me. For whatever <laughs> reason, I don't know why I went. But mm-hmm. I got uh, elected chairman of the committee at the time. And since none of us seemed to have any idea what we were to do, how we were supposed to do any of this, mm-hmm. um, they made the decision to uh, to send me to, uh, back in the days when somebody actually had some money to do this, yeah. they made the decision to send me out here to Utah in 1988 to, uh, to the uh, Utah school and see what I could learn. All right. And um, do you feel like you um, did learn that information and... Um, were able to bring it back to Kentucky? Well, I think yes, because what, what happened to me uh, as part of my personal story when mm-hmm. I came out here that very first time, not knowing very much at all about the, the disease process of, of uh, addiction, it was called at that time, or alcoholism mm-hmm. that it was called at that time. I met people that were doing this kind of work that we were trying to set up in Kentucky Mm -hmm. who were doing this in other states. And so back in those days, we we learned this was pre-internet, pre-cell phone, pre-all of the easy way we can do things today. Uh, It was snail mail and faxes and landlines. we would beg, borrow, or steal whatever was working in another place. Maybe we could make that work in our place. But Mm -hmm. one of the things that happened to me when I came out here in in 1988 was, uh, first of all, I didn't know a soul. Yeah. Uh, But I was uh, fortunate to to run into a couple of fellow, now fellow dinosaurs (laughs) who, who took me under their paws or their wings mm-hmm. or whatever you want to say, uh, if they were pterodactyls, I guess, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, uh, kind of introduced me around to some people who were at that time very active in this uh, field of trying to, to help mm-hmm. within the profession. 
And I came to the realization that uh, there might be something wrong with me also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I credit today two of those fellows with planting the seeds that germinated some eight years later, mm -hmm. uh, seven years later into my, my own recovery. And um, did you continue to come um, in those years leading up to your recovery and then after yeah, I your came recovery? Yeah, I came twice more. And actually, the, the last time that I came uh, before I got uh, sober myself was in the summer of 1995, and I was not in a very good place uh, uh, in my own addiction story at that time and, and thought I would come out here for a week and see if I could um, survive, if you will, mm -hmm. for a week without uh, using uh, substances. And, and I uh, uh, had a miserable time and went back home and immediately started right back into my old behaviors. And, and that lasted for another... Um, almost five months before uh, I had the epiphany that brought me to now uh, 22 years plus of continuous sobriety. That is amazing. Um, and um, can you tell us a little bit about um, some of the changes that you've seen over the years in the Institute? Well, the main changes that I've seen in the Institute were uh, particularly as it related to when it was under the old format. Mm -hmm. uh, the pharmacy section was the largest section of all of the sections in that school. There might mm -hmm. be seven or 800 people that would come to the Utah school, of which okay. close to 400 of them were pharmacists and, mm -hmm. so, and student pharmacists. And so we sort of pro uh, provided the major financial support for keeping the school going. Mm -hmm. And and um, the programming was such that we had some of the sessions were pharmacy only, mm -hmm. and then some of the sessions were done whole school. So we would have lectures in a larger auditorium area in the student uh, union mm -hmm. that uh, anybody and everybody was invited to that was, that was attending the school. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the major changes that that happened was the the uh, the school uh, turned out had to, they they made the decision to fold um, four years ago five years ago mm -hmm. because the the school at the time was uh, the university at the time was needing the space that we were using for the Utah school mm -hmm. uh, for student orientations and things and it just couldn't quite figure out how they would fit. Um, all this many people into an area when they needed it for student orientation. So then we were fortunate that uh, Keith Marciniak and some of the wiser folks at APHA took the ball, if you will, using that metaphor, and run with it and, yeah. and, and set up the APHA Institute as we know it today. Yeah, I'm definitely glad they did that. Um, so I know you work um, with the... Um, Kentucky uh, Professionals Pro Recovery Network. Yeah, PRN. Yeah. Um, okay, right. I was going to say, is it the same as what yeah. we call it in Texas? Uh, and so is that where you're seeing, um, you know, a lot of the great need in your state, or do you see it, you know, other places too? Well, I think the, the, the biggest benefit of, of coming to something like this institute mm -hmm. is that uh, in the 45 years since I – uh, graduated pharmacy school. Mm -hmm. um, there was nothing taught in those days, and and from from many years of being a, a preceptor and and taking APPE students, I found out from students from all over the country because they found people from all over the country found out that yeah. that I did this kind of work, and I mm -hmm. had I had students come from Missouri to New York to Florida to you name it, all came to Louisville to do. Wow. rotations with me mm -hmm. uh, it isn't being taught it's yeah. not being taught in pharmacy school to to any extent uh, uh, maybe an hour or two lecture uh, uh, an elective possibly mm -hmm. uh, it's not being taught in nursing school medical school dental school physical therapy yeah nobody spends much time on uh, what's now called substance use disorders mm -hmm. uh, teaching 
about a disease that has a prevalence uh, uh, same as diabetes. Yeah. Um, do you see with the progression of the years um, with the new students coming that it is, uh, do you see advancement in the field of it being treated more like a disease? I, I'm hoping so. I think mm -hmm. I can I can say in the, in the years, particularly since uh, 2000, I've only missed being here one year. I've seen uh, mm -hmm. a, a growth in knowledge among the students as to um, the recognition that that uh, addiction, substance use disorder, is a real problem in, in the country. Mm -hmm. um, we've all heard of the opioid epidemic, uh, which is, you know, forefront in a lot of uh, news reports, but people tend to also forget that uh, alcohol is still the most widely available substance of abuse. Marijuana is being uh, legalized, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, for quote-unquote medicinal purposes as right. well as for recreational purposes in various states. Um, we still have benzodiazepines as a problem. Mm -hmm. um, uh, substance use disorders are extremely prevalent. I, I reference, I'm, I'm extremely pleased when I have the opportunity to lecture about this, whether it's in front of a group of uh, dentists for a continuing education or whether it's at the pharmacy school or mm -hmm. dental schools in Kentucky to, to reference the 2016 Surgeon General's report on, mm -hmm. on substance use disorders and, and with 14.7% lifetime prevalence, 8% uh, mm -hmm. current uh, use, it's, it's there. Yeah. And if you don't recognize it if you have your head in the sand about something like this you're uh, um, going to be finding yourself in a lot of trouble so. yeah um so just for any listeners that might not know can you i know it works a little bit different in every state but can you explain um just an overview of the professional recovery network and kind certainly, of what it is certainly as i said i started doing this in 1986 uh, mm -hmm. as a volunteer under the kentucky pharmacist association they, after a couple of years, became concerned about uh, liability for the association and basically said, thanks for your help, uh, see you bye, and uh, that kind of left me all by myself. I, I did this as a volunteer on my own from 86 until uh, 2000. Wow. Uh, I was very fortunate that uh, the board executive director at the time, Michael Monet, mm -hmm. uh, it was instrumental in helping get legislation passed to change our Pharmacy Practice Act mm -hmm. in 1998 that actually added some funding for the program uh, into mm -hmm. the Board of Pharmacy uh, Practice Act. And mm -hmm. so the Board of Pharmacy was able to actually hire me as a part-time employee beginning in 2000 um, to be the uh, coordinator of the uh, at that time, it was called the Impaired Pharmacist Committee, which okay. we changed very quickly yeah. to, to, to the Pharmacist Recovery Network Committee, and, uh -huh. and uh, um, it has since become uh, uh, quite an active uh, part of the Board of Pharmacy dealing with anyone that may have an issue. Um, my practice experience, I had community pharmacy practice, both independent and, and chain store, but mm -hmm. I uh, also had the opportunity, I used to say I was sent to prison in, in uh, uh, 1981, but I, I had a pharmacy and drug inspector come in one day to the store I was working at and said, Brian, I think you need to go to prison. And uh, they opened a new medium security prison in the county where I was working, and he said they have a pharmacist position, and you'd be perfect for it. So uh, I became the director of pharmacy for the Kentucky Department of Corrections for 22 years and wow. was able to retire in 2003 from that position. Mm -hmm. Wondered what I was going to do with the rest of my professional career, and mm -hmm. then the Board of Dentistry called me, and the Board of Physical Therapy called me, and the Board Veterinary medicine called me, and pretty soon uh, uh, I had a full-time practice uh, working with licensed professionals who may have substance use issues or other impairments that may affect their ability to practice. So mm -hmm. I work with multiple licensing boards in Kentucky, basically everyone except medicine, nursing, and law, 
who have their own programs. Yeah. Um, so it's been my full-time practice for 15 years, and, nice. and uh, it's not something that's taught. It's something that I learned by doing. And, yeah. And I've been fortunate to find a young lady who, who has been working with me now for a year and a half, and yeah. hopefully she'll take over one of these days as I age and decide that someday I need to retire. And um, and it's a way that um, these professionals can, is it self-reporting? Um, well, it, yeah, I'm pleased that you asked that question. I'm very mm -hmm. fortunate that in Kentucky, the boards with whom I work allow us at the Professionals Recovery Network mm -hmm. to have someone self-report to us. Mm -hmm. And they can remain anonymous to mm -hmm. the board. And this, I'll talk about pharmacy in particular. Okay. Roughly 20% of my clients are clients with within the pharmacy profession, and we mm -hmm. do work with technicians, we work with student pharmacists, and we work with, with pharmacists. Mm -hmm. um, almost 20% of them are self-report. In other words, they know that the program's there. I, uh, I lecture at both of our schools of pharmacy each year to make sure the students know that there's there's a program here to help in mm -hmm. case there's there's the need for this. And as long as there's not a complaint filed or, or anything else that brings that particular person to the attention of the board, mm -hmm. the board need never know uh, that they're working with us. Yeah. Uh, again, if there's a complaint filed, they get uh, confirmed that they're working with us mm -hmm. if, uh, if they violate their monitoring contract. In other words, if they have something happen that violates their contract with mm -hmm. us, that, that shows that they haven't been able to remain abstinent from their substance uh, of abuse, then that gets them known to the board, and they deal with the consequences of that. Yeah. I think those are, when I came to pharmacy school, um, we had someone from the um, Texas PR and come mm -hmm. talk to us, and uh, I thought that was the first I've ever heard of it, and I thought that was a really cool program um, to have available. Not every state has it, and it's, it's very, very, um, I think, thoughtful of mm -hmm. uh, states that have licensing boards that are, are willing and able to have programs like this because mm -hmm. boards' ultimate purpose is to uh, protect their public. Yeah. And they do that by regulating the profession that the board belongs to, mm -hmm. uh, and they can do that protection of the public by getting help for the practitioner who has the problem. Right. And so if, if you get the pharmacist help, you get the student pharmacist the help they need, mm -hmm. they're saving that life, hopefully getting that person back into being a productive member of the profession, mm -hmm. and you're protecting the public from somebody who might be practicing when they probably shouldn't be practicing. Yeah, definitely. Um so we've hit on this a little bit, um, but why do you think it's so important that students continue to come here? I know we've talked, you've talked a little bit about, you know, the statistics of things, mm -hmm. but um, just some of the things you've seen over the year of just the importance of this institute. Well, I, I, I think that what uh, I and some of the dinosaurs uh, have noticed over the years as, student come, as students come, the program at the institute is built day by day by day in a certain order. Mm -hmm. We introduce things to the new attendees in a certain order. And as that process builds, students become more self-aware of what might be going on in their lives that uh, have particularly been touched in a certain way mm -hmm. by someone or some ones in their uh, circle of friends or family who may have a substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. And as the, the days go on for the Institute, we start seeing students uh, um, looking emotional, acting emotional, mm -hmm. wanting to talk to those of us. When, when we start the conference, we urge, when we start the Institute, we urge the attendees that, you know, if you start feeling something, mm -hmm. uh, are concerned about something, have questions about anything during your time here. Mm -hmm. We have a professional counselor who's here. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, some of the dinosaurs stand up and say, any of those people who might have a mentor mm -hmm. uh, ribbon on their uh, name badge, talk to them. Mm -hmm. uh, 
don't hold your feelings in, and particularly when we come to the day when we have uh, the 12-step meeting that's called Al-Anon, which is for families and friends of alcoholics or other people that may have substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people whose emotions have bubbled to the surface, and, and you start seeing people and hearing people share uh, family members that, that may have the disease, either active or not currently in recovery, or those that they've lost due to this disease. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think that um, I can say from a student's perspective that um, it definitely is a very um, welcoming environment to come talk to you guys afterwards if we need it. Um, and there is a lot of people, um, mentors, available here. Um, so what do you, where do you expect this, um, do you expect Institute to continue to go forward and um, grow? And Well, I, I, I expect it to go forward. Um, it really can't grow any larger than it is because yeah. the facility has a, a limit of 400 people. And mm -hmm. so um, there are limits placed on the number of people who can attend, and right. that means it becomes particularly competitive for the students to get a slot to be here. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a certain number of seats that they want to save out of the 400 for um, those of us who are dinosaurs and also for those who might be out uh, as practitioners, uh, Board of Pharmacy members, others who might be interested, Board of Pharmacy inspectors. Um, there's really not an opportunity to have any larger growth mm -hmm. uh, in numbers than what we have. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, but um, you, do, you did say you think that it will continue to go on. So yes, there will be yes. lots of opportunity for students. Yeah, so, I, I, okay. I, I, I have no, uh, received no inkling that, uh, that this is going to disappear. I think APHA through the uh, uh, ASP has decided that this is a worthwhile project uh, for the ASP to, to continue since they're the ones that are sort of spearheading this institute. Gotcha. Okay, so I know you know all of the speakers that are here, but I'm going to put you on the spot and say besides your own sessions, what would be your favorite session out of the weekend or the week? Well, that's that's very hard to, yeah. to put one over the other because I think some of they serve different purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, the one today on the, and I put it in quotes again, medicinal marijuana, because mm -hmm. that, there are um, mixed feelings within the profession about whether there is such a thing as medical marijuana since mm -hmm. it's not been studied, it's not FDA approved, and, and mm -hmm. so on. That um, uh, presentation today was an informative presentation. Right. Uh, the presentations that we had by uh, Dr. Bob Weathers, the, those presentations were dealing a lot with family dynamics and with mm -hmm. feelings. The presentations that we had by Dr. Merrill Norton about the disease mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the brain chemistry aspects of it, there again, that's informational, but but you've got this being done intentionally by the people who do the programming for this mm -hmm. so that you not only provide educational material, mm -hmm. scientifically backed facts to the students, but you're also providing um, a backdrop of it isn't all black and white facts. This disease involves feelings. Mm -hmm. Feelings are very difficult to quantify. And in doing so, the purpose is to let, uh, uh, I think, the attendees know, but whether it's new attendees or those of us that come back year after year, to be reminded that we're dealing with people. Mm -hmm. We're not dealing with just a disease. We're dealing with people who have a disease. Mm -hmm. disease that's treatable, but it's also a disease that uh, the people who have it when they're active in their uh, substance use uh, aren't very nice people to be around. Yeah. I told uh, our one of our student deans is here with us, and I told her, you know, you always tell us empathy, empathy, empathy all the time in school. And I said, um, I never truly, truly understood it until I was here. Um because I think you guys do a, a lot of programming around that, and that's when we can truly have that emotional growth and put it aside um, 
I mean, have the education as well, but yeah, see the and other people side of people it. who are active in their addiction aren't aren't nice people to be around. As yeah. I said, uh, it's hard to have empathy and uh, um, be comfortable in trying to treat them as fellow human beings yeah. when they're doing things that are um, hurtful. Yeah, in more, in many different ways. I agree. Um, so what do you recommend for anyone that's interested in attending um, in the future as far as if you're um, already a pharmacist? Uh, well, it's it's interesting because I'm not sure how much this is publicized among the pharmacy community for those that are out in practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, since it's run through the ASP, most of the um, um, publicity, if you will, goes out to the colleges through mm-hmm. the student chapters of the, of the student pharmacists. So um, there really isn't a lot of, of publicity to um, practicing pharmacists. I think the ones that are here that are not uh, involved with the board probably found out about it through a pharmacy school, mm-hmm. and they were either on faculty or, or for whatever reason heard about it that way. Mm-hmm. Um Board members, uh, a lot of the state boards are notified of this program so that they can consider sending board members. I've had some really interesting conversations with a board member from Wyoming who happens to be a veterinarian who's on the Board of Pharmacy. Oh. Um, but do you, um, um, even, you know, faculty members at the schools of the ASP chapters and um, would you encourage them to attend? Most certainly. I, I would encourage anybody who has an interest, uh, uh, if you're working with students as a faculty member, are you going to see people who either are active in substance use or mm-hmm. just because you're a student doesn't mean you may not have developed a problem with alcohol or, or other substance while you're in school. Right. Um, the pharmacy schools in Kentucky, if a student has... Uh, uh, a DUI while they're in school, they're re- mm-hmm. they're referred to our PRN. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they have, uh, and I've just recently had uh, two that had marijuana in their urine when they were tested before going for IPPE, mm-hmm. um, they have been referred to us mm-hmm. at the PRN for, for monitoring. It doesn't mean that they have a substance use disorder. It means that they've done something that's been a violation of the student code of conduct in that particular school, and and they have consequences because of that. Now, those consequences are, are, uh, yes, school-related, but it can also affect their ability to get into an APPE site, an IPPE site, Mm -hmm. uh, and may come up when the board does a criminal background check when they want to sit for their licensing exam. So try very hard when I'm when I'm speaking to students at both of our pharmacy schools in Kentucky that uh, what you do here while you're in school can have a profound effect on on your ability to be licensed and it can follow you for a while if you're not careful yeah okay well thank you so much for joining me today um, I think what you're doing here at Institute and in um, Kentucky is a really awesome thing Um, And thank you, Pharmacy Leaders Podcast, um, for again allowing us to have these episodes. And I'll talk to you guys in the next episode. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag #PharmacyLeaders. 